Welcome to Teaching Artist Podcast, a show dedicated to discussions of teaching art to kids, making art, and how those things overlap and feed each other. I'm Rebecca Potts, your host, a visual arts teaching artist. get into this week's episode with the amazing Jennifer Love Geronda. I'm so excited to share that our first online exhibit is open. Contemporary art for young audiences is what we're calling this collaboration between Teaching Artist Podcast and Curated for Kids. Our first exhibit is titled See Where It Takes You. This online group exhibition just opened on July 10th. During this great pause, while we are spending more time at home connected through devices, this exhibit brings contemporary artwork and inspiration to children in their homes. This is more than an exhibit. It is also a resource for parents and art teachers. This exhibit showcases for young audiences the work of nine artists, many of whom are also teachers. The show includes video interviews with the artists, sharing their creative process, the meanings behind their work, and their advice for aspiring artists. We have also included a few art activities related to the exhibit. The title comes from The Dot by Peter H. Reynolds. Just make a mark and see where it takes you, says Vashti's teacher in The Dot. This book is a favorite of elementary art teachers and has even inspired International Dot Day celebrations around the world. That first dot Vashti makes leads her on a journey of creating all sorts of dots, exploring color and scale, positive and negative space. Like many contemporary artists, she discovers an interest and digs into it, pushing her work in new directions. The participating artists in this exhibit are Pamela Allen, Stephanie Behrens, Erin Boswell, Dean Bowers, Nikki Brugnoli, Denise Gasser, Heather Lowe, Deborah Riley, and Alice Stone Collins. While our focus is on sharing artwork in an accessible way, the work is for sale. 70% of sales will directly support the artists, while 20% will be donated to an incredible organization. We are thrilled to support Amplifier through this exhibit. They offer free programming for educators and have also developed at-home learning toolkits. Check out more on their website, amplifier.org. Join us for our Artist Talk series in Instagram Live. Be sure to follow us at Teaching Artist Podcast and at Curated for Kids. I can't wait. You can view the show at tapexhibit.com. Jennifer Love Geronda is such an accomplished art teacher and artist. She shared really helpful tips on grant writing, teaching, and getting your art out there. I love how she approaches art and teaching and life with such a can-do attitude. She is so encouraging of other artists and teachers and really committed to her art making. Jennifer has been making a piece every day since January 2012. Jennifer Love Geronda is a teaching artist in every sense of the phrase. She studied art at East Carolina University in Greenville, North Carolina, where she obtained BFA and M.Ed. degrees. She has participated in numerous art shows and exhibits. She says, my goal is to put some whimsy and light out into the world. A little of my heart. Jennifer has taught art in various grade levels from K through 12 for over 15 years and is a National Board Certified Teacher. She has written many successful grants for her schools and classrooms over the years. This year, she was recognized as making significant contributions to art and culture with the Lehman Excellence in Arts Education Award from the Cultural Council for Palm Beach County. It is just one of many awards that she's received throughout her career. Hello. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, how are you? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. 
I'm here with Jennifer Love Gironda. Yeah, my kids call me Miss G. Yeah, make it easy. <laughs> so I love to start with a little bit of background. How did you become an artist? How did you become a teacher? Which one kind of came first? Okay, well, I've, I've always been an artist. You can ask my mom. You know, I always love to arrange things and, you know, just put things together. Um, when I was a kid, I was obsessed with coloring. And I had this, you remember the shed spread butter? came in the big tub oh yes or country <laughs> crock or whatever it is yeah, yeah, country yeah. crock gosh this is actually in hindsight now I'm like thinking how did we have an empty one of those that's kind of bad <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I had one of those and I would keep my crayons in it and I would just carry that around everywhere I went with my coloring book and I actually would leave all the pictures in the book and start at the beginning and go to the end because I wanted it to look like a finished book that I'd made, yeah. you know? <laughs> uh. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I always loved art class and really stood out, you know, because I really enjoyed it and was pretty good at, at art for my age. But, you know, the main thing is just the way I, I love doing it so much. Mm-hmm. Early on, I was really interested in, in art always, and I always did it. But in high school is when I decided that I actually wanted to be an art teacher. So I had two reasons made me look to be an art teacher. One was I had an amazing high school art teacher, which I think a lot of us probably that our teachers, you're a teacher because of a really good teacher or a really bad teacher. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily for me, it was a really good teacher. So uh, Robin Calcutt at Union Pines High School, and she was just amazing. When I went into her class, she would always smile and she was just so joyful in everything that she did. And she was so knowledgeable. And I just, it was my favorite class to go to. I, I felt like it was like my home. And uh, also when I was in the upper levels of high school, I heard, heard about a scholarship that they give out in North Carolina called the North Carolina Teaching Fellows Scholarship. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I grew up with no money and not knowing how I was going to go to college, but my mom always, you know, let me know, like, I was definitely going to college. We didn't know how, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, yeah. but I, I ended up, uh, I, I got that scholarship and it paid for my four years of college. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. It's, and it's a really cool scholarship. They don't have it anymore in North Carolina, but you know, the idea is you want to have your best and brightest students instead of going off into medical careers or lawyers to go into teaching. And as you know, an incentive, they would pay your school. And then in return, when you graduate, you teach a certain number of years and still get paid teaching, you know, just to mm-hmm. pay back the state. Yeah. It's like a commitment to teach. Yeah. Yeah. And then then it pays it off. And, you know, you can teach, you can keep teaching, you can go to another state. But, you know, ideally, they would want you to, to stay, you know, stay there or stay in the profession. Yeah. It's something I'm 100% glad always that I, I chose to pursue that scholarship. Um, I was able to go to East Carolina University in Greenville, North Carolina. Mm-hmm. I just loved it. Like, I even if I step foot on that campus right now, I feel like 100% more alive <laughs> It's amazing the energy that you get, you know, from all these people, you know, learning and creating. And it's funny because, and you've probably done this yourself, you change medium, Mm -hmm. you know, like the materials that you work with. So in high school, I was always just doing drawing and painting. And then when I got to college, I discovered textiles. Ah. Yeah, so I did weaving and surface design and all that. It's, it's funny. It seems like everything's just one thing's always led to another and opened up another opportunity. Yeah. And then did you kind of stick with textiles or your? I, yeah, I did. I, um, I, I had to apply for the textiles program. You know, it's still mm-hmm. an art education major, mm-hmm. but I actually dub, uh, double majored so that I would have an equal amount of studio hours, you know, because it was really important to me to be an artist. But yeah, I had to um, submit for textiles. I got in and I took like five weaving studios and surface design studios. And that's like doing dye work. Ooh. Yeah, I discovered that I was the worst sewer in the world. Like awful. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's just something that never appealed to me. But I love to hand stitch uh-huh. and I love to beading. I could sit and bead for eight hours and not get up. Uh. Like, I just love it. But yes, I, I did the textiles and then later on, I got back to doing some drawing and painting. And, you know, now I kind of do more of that, which is kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, kind of going back and forth. Yeah. But I know a lot of your drawing and painting now is is sort of focused on fashion, right? Uh, yeah. And it's funny because, well, okay, I guess I, I don't know about where I would mention this, but one thing that's unique about me, and I, I can't believe I didn't mention this before, Ricky Leiter, she's a, um, a local lady in the art scene. She has a website and a newsletter, blog, all this. She calls it an elevator pitch. Uh-huh. It's like when you meet somebody, you got to tell them right immediately, what are you about? Well, yeah. we just established I'm about art and teaching. But 
one thing that definitely people should know is I made a commitment to doing a piece of art every day in January of 2012. So I'm in year nine of that now. Wow. And you're, you're keeping up with it. Every day. Yeah. So wow. what's happened over um, that process of making art for nine years every day, the first thing that's happened is, you know, I always make time for my artwork. Never, never fail. Mm -hmm. But then also, you know, you kind of see like things like I like this, I don't like this. You see like reoccurring themes and colors and ideas. But I started doing fashion illustration that first year and I'd never heard of it. I I didn't know it was a thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I grew up in a small town in Cameron, North Carolina. I knew to look at fashion magazines and I loved them, but I didn't know that people actually did that. And, you know, I may have done something different if I'd known about it sooner, maybe. So I've, over the years, I've done a little bit of fashion illustration almost every year. And this year specifically, my goal is to only do fashion illustrations for the full year. Mm -hmm. Because usually I work in, I do what I call my big eyed girls. They're kind of these like just fun, whimsical girls, you know, with crazy hair and fun fashion, but they have big eyes and uh, long necks. You know, and then I also do um, mm. realistic portraits where I do the face in um, usually graphite with detail shading. And then I'll do text and watercolor in the background. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of weird this year to not do any of the other stuff. But so far I have this whole since 2012 or 2020 started, I have um, just done the fashion illustration. Wow. Yeah. And I'm actually looking at some of them now and noticing that you're also sort of focused like in terms of color each month, which is really, really cool to see. And (laughs) it's like I I work very well if I'm very structured Mm -hmm. because then I can do whatever I want, but I stay within those constraints. And if it changes a little bit, that's okay. But yeah, um, in January, you know, I was all excited about, weren't we all? (laughs) I was all excited. I was excited about 2020. <laughs> Little did I know. So, yeah. so there was all this talk about like the roaring 20s, you know. So I thought it would be fun if I combined the idea of 1920s fashion and then towards the end of the month, disco. Yeah. <laughs> so every day that yeah. month, I did a little fashion illustration. My color scheme was like gold and silver. And part of the reason I did that, this is actually everything goes together, you know. My New Year's Eve dress, I had bought a dress from just like a, you know, like a New York company. It was, it was cute, but you know, you don't want to show up and somebody's got your same dress on. Like that's not happening. Right. So, <laughs> so I got this really nice silver fringe sequin dress. It's, it's pretty. I'm extra and I wanted the dress to be extra. <laughs> I went and bought some um, pretty embellished uh, gold fabric uh, and I chopped that up into different pieces and hand stitched it into the dress so that I had like a sleeve and I had some extra gold layers in between the silver. So the yeah. pieces that I used during my art month were scraps. A lot of them were scraps from that dress. Yeah. <laughs> I'm noticing that, that they're drawings and paintings, but there's textiles yeah. attached and almost collaged into it. Yeah. That was kind of a fun, like mixed media thing. Yeah. So that was January. And in February, I love Disney. Well, I'm in Florida, you know, so we do uh-huh. Disney here. Yeah. <laughs> but I had done a previous series where I took the Disney characters, like the female villains and uh, princesses, and I'd done my own fashion design based on their costumes. Mm. So in February, yeah. to add a twist, I did it in Valentine's Day colors because I love, I love yeah. like holidays and silly stuff like that. So um, that month, it's Disney princesses with their outfits reimagined in the reds and pinks and white. And then the next month, I kind of wanted to do just this watercolor technique where you blow with a straw. And that that was actually inspired by the dress. You can't tell it's a dress, but in the background where the piece of fabric that I'm putting my pieces on every day it's a dress. Oh, and cool. later, <laughs> later on in the series, I actually put the dress on yeah, yeah. <laughs> and held it and was like, look, this is, you know, this is my piece of inspiration. And then, you know, last yeah. month was coffee. And it's funny because I think one of the things I saw like on kind of like our questions before this was how does the teaching inform the art and the art inform the teaching, right? Yeah, yeah. So this one is actually the April series is prime time quarantine life. <laughs> you know, like yep. we're all yeah. in our pajamas, can't go to the store or you don't want to go to the store. So the reason that I decided to do painting with coffee is because I was thinking my students might be at home thinking, oh, I don't have, because a lot of my students are in a lower income bracket 
and they don't have money to go and get things. Right. But in this time, you don't want to go get things anyway. Right. So I was, try- I was trying to do something where I can inspire my students to think about things around the house that they could use as paint. And that's why I did the coffee because I figured most of the kids have coffee at home or Kool-Aid or, you know, toothpaste or something that they can make a mark with. Right. Yeah, that's great. That's, that was a really fun series. And, and you can tell the series where I really, really get into it because there'll be more than the daily amount. Like that one ended up being like 40 pieces, I think. Because <laughs> I, I was uh, another advantage to being at home now with this quarantine life is I've been able to um, catch up on Project Runway, which, oh, which is yes. my, my life. Um, and then I watched Making oh. the Cut because I love Tim Gunn. So that's why there's so many because I was drawing either the winner or my favorite. Yeah. And it's kind of kind uh. of funny because some of those, um, I always, when I do the Project Run- Runway drawings, I always contact the designer and let them see or tag them. And I always say, if you want this, you let me know and I'll send it to you. So I think I mailed off all of them, but one. I haven't heard back from one. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's kind of cool. Yeah. It's kind of neat just a gift to them for inspiring me to do the work. Yeah. And then this month is kind of different for me. I'm sure you saw the jewelry pieces. Did you see those? I haven't yet. So they're, they're on Instagram. And if you click on the picture, oh, okay. um, there's a time lapse video that shows me making it. So that's kind of fun. But I wanted to do draw a fashion figure, very limited line work. And then I have an extensive costume jewelry collection. And I wanted to just go and grab a color, color story, you know, some necklaces, earrings, bracelets, whatever from my collection, put them out on the table and create a piece of fashion from the jewelry. So that's what, that's what I've been doing. And the scary part for me is I don't attach them. So I document me making the work and then I photograph it when I'm done and then I pick it up and it all falls off. And that was terrifying. (laughs) Yeah. But also trying to show my students it's okay if you want to make temporary art by arranging things or put, you know, putting things together in a different way, you know, rearranging your whatever, you know, it doesn't always have to be like a permanent thing that you'll put away somewhere and it'll gather dust. Right. So that's been kind of fun. Yeah. And do you share the coffee paintings or any of the other artwork yeah, with your yeah. students? Um, I always share, yeah. uh, you know, what I'm doing, especially with my AP students, because we're always going back and forth, either through text, DM, email, mm-hmm. you know, and I always let them know like what I'm working on and I'll post in our story, you know, here's some ideas. So, and, and you know, sometimes some of the kids will try them out. My idea for my current series, which I'm calling Finding Fashion, because I'm finding it from around, you know, just around, that was uh-huh. also inspired by students. Oh, cool. Like what they're wearing? Um, no, uh, for, or what they're yeah, making. One of my students, um, we did this assignment where they had to just pick household things around. And there were two artists that we were looking at. One is Caroline Fowl. And she does this really cool arrangements and she works with color in the background, but just everyday objects. But she arranges them like in a value scale or they're just really beautiful. And then Adam, Adam yeah. Hillman, he takes everyday objects and he'll manipulate them and arrange them. And they're just so cool to look at. You know, it's like just designed really yeah. well. So I gave my students an assignment for their weekly class assignment and it was pick a color scheme and arrange things at home. Mm-hmm. So my one student, Candelaria, she got pasta. And in one picture, she arranged the pasta in like a geometric, you know, very like visually balanced, symmetrical design. It was really nice and it's just really easy on your eyes. And then they also have a, a second assignment every week where they're turning in some kind of sketch or work of an ongoing idea that they've been working on all year. You know, like she mm-hmm. loves fashion. I have other students that are into graffiti, um, architecture, like whatever they're into. I keep them, I, I kind of mm-hmm. push them to keep working on it, keep working on it throughout the year. Nice. But she took that same pasta and she made it into a dress. Oh, cool. And wow. so I had that in the, in the back of my head when I was coming up with my theme for May. Mm-hmm. So credit to Candelaria in first period. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of fun. But yeah, it's kind of like the art informs the teaching. The teaching informs the art. I couldn't do one without the other. And I really value trying to do a good job at at both is very important to me. Yeah, that's huge. And how they kind of go back and forth like that. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, can't help but have it that way, you know. Right. Uh, And is there anything you kind of wish you had known when you started out teaching? Oh, yeah. Um, Well, there's a couple of things. (laughs) So the number one thing, if, if I could have told myself when I first started teaching, one thing I would have said would be to make time to do my own work, you Mm -hmm. know, because especially, you know, you know, that first year teaching, you're just trying to survive. Yeah. (laughs) You were like, like, what is it? Well, first of all, you're sick all the time. (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, uh, you know, you're just like, I'm sick, I'm tired, just can't seem to get up ahead of anything. You know, it's, it's tough. Even if you're great, it's going to be tough that first year. But if you get into the habit from the start of not making time for your art, then it'll be harder later to make that time for yourself. But it's, it is important, even if it's just sitting down for 30 minutes in the morning, you know, with your coffee and doing a doodle or, you know, you've got a quilt that you're working on for a couple of years. It's just having some kind of creative outlet that you commit to giving yourself that time, ideally every day. But if you can't do every day, don't beat yourself up, do it when you can. Right. So that would be my number one. My number two would be, okay, I don't, I, maybe it's just me. Keep the teacher bag. You're not going to do any of that work. Keep it at school. If I had a dollar for every time I have dragged a bag of teaching things to grade, look at, plan, whatever, dragged them home, almost broke my shoulder, <sighs> and then it sits on the floor. Yeah. And then the next morning I pick it up and I take it back to school. Don't do that. Like, go ahead and be honest <laughs> with yourself. Like, I'm not going to do this. Stay at school or get there early to do it and leave it there. Yeah. Let's be honest. You're not. And if you are doing it at home, why are you doing it at home? That's your off time. <laughs> you know, like live your life. Right. <laughs> live your life. Yeah. But those would be the two things that I would definitely tell myself teaching at DH Conley, you know, however many years ago, 16 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and have you always been at the high school level? No, I started off at Conley and then I taught at another high school And I've moved around a lot, usually because of us changing a job or going to school, like going back to grad school. So I taught for four years in North Carolina high school and then took two years off because we moved back home. It was a death in the family. And then we moved to California, which I've mentioned. We lived in San Diego and I didn't teach. I worked at a corporate office in San Diego and definitely decided it was not for me. (laughs) Let me tell you, I had the best decorated cubicle in that office. And I was very creative in the way I approached things. And, I, and I, I did find, like, that's the one thing with teaching. Teaching really does prepare you to be, if you want to be good or excel at other things because of the skills you learn teaching, you know, like being organized and managing your time. So I was able to be successful mm-hmm. at my job there, but it just wasn't for me. I wasn't able to be creative and I was used to interacting with students. So when I, when mm-hmm. I came back to North Carolina for grad school, I taught elementary, kindergarten through second grade. And let me tell you, that was some work. <laughs> that was some work. You yeah. know, I mean, Ooh. they're little. <laughs> you know, and at me having just taught high school and then coming out from the corporate world, being around more adults and, you know, older teenagers before that, I didn't know, you know, my degree is K-12, but I hadn't, had not been around young children like that. You know, I, I remember when I first started teaching, I was just so frustrated. And my principal, Dawn Singleton, pulled me aside and I told her, she's like, how's it going? I was like, yeah, I'm just real frustrated. I'm trying to do stuff and I'm trying to do, and you know, you're trying to do these higher level projects because you don't want to just have scribble, even though you know that their scribble improved from the last time yeah. and their color use is amazing, you know, but you, you know, like. As an artist, you're like, oh, now we got to be, you know, we got to put this on the wall. Uh. She said to me, she said, Jenny, so you got to remember, they don't know much. And this was about a kindergarten class. And that, that was so liberating to me when I finally kind of get past that and be like, we're going to have fun. I'm going to teach them these things that they don't know. They don't know how to glue. We're going to sing a song about it. You know, they don't yeah. know how to hold yeah. things, you know, like, so, um, you know, just keeping in mind, calming down the artist part of me and getting more into the, the teaching, the technique and really celebrating all their little victories with what they're doing. Yeah. But yes, I taught kindergarten through second grade for just a couple years. Mm-hmm. And then uh, my husband decided to get his PhD. So that's when we came to Florida. Nice. Yeah. And then you went back to high school. Yeah. Well, I actually taught middle school for a while. Okay. And I, I really enjoyed it. I was at a school kind of not in the, the fancy part of Florida. It was out west in a, a real rural town farming community. Mm. And we didn't have any friends. So we just moved here. You know, we had family, but, you know, like we didn't have anybody to hang out with and do things with. So yeah. John was always working on his, I mean, if you've been around anybody doing graduate level work, it's tough, but, mm-hmm. you know, doctoral work. That's like another level. Mm. So I was at home and he was always doing research and reading and everything. So I was kind of bored. So I started writing grants. Ah, nice. Yeah. And I got really good at it. So I had a ton of grants at that school. Great experience. And then uh, we moved down south for a little bit. So I taught at a private school there. Didn't like that as much. And then came back up to this area 
and I've been at Lake Worth High School for the past six years teaching high school. Awesome. But that's, that's definitely, I can teach any grade and I will, you know, if I need to. But my favorite grade to teach is definitely high school. Yeah. Because I feel like you're getting them when they're kind of, you know, they're figuring out what they want to do. And artistically, they're really figuring out what materials they like to work with. What do they want to say as an artist? You know, I just, I just love all, all of that, being a part of that part of their life. Yeah. Helping them kind of find that direction. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, watching them, you know, have success, make mistakes, you know, just being there for them. Yeah. I love, I love teaching high school. Nice. And would you have any grant writing tips for other teachers? Oh, yeah. And this is kind of weird, but, and again, it goes back to me being really OCD and just really into how things look. The first thing I always do with a grant is I will, when I start the document to whatever supporting, create whatever supporting evidence or the application, I always mimic exactly what the grant looked like. Uh So if it had, you know, whatever header across the top, even a logo, I'll put it, I will get it onto what I send to them. Because in my mind, if they're getting a piece of paper, you know, and documents and everything, and it already looks like what they took the time to put together, then in their mind, it's like, oh, this is already something we like. This is something we, we support, uh-huh. you know, like so that. And that's just, it might be a little yeah. thing for me, but I've always done that. I've had a lot of success with it. And, you know, really just going through the document and just highlighting and making sure everything that it asks you to do, you do. Right. And if it has you write a narrative, copy and paste that narrative and just go line by line and write over it so that you know you're answering all the questions, you know, or hitting all the points that they wanted to highlight it or bold it, but make it look like what they gave you. Right. So that's always really worked for me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's kind of the same in some ways with job applications, yeah. like use the same language that they use. Yeah. And, you know, I would, I would do that way too, if I was, let's say I was going back out into the corporate world, you know, like you talk about mm-hmm. having their corporate environment or, you know, like how, kind of how they are, like what they like to be known for. So you want to speak to them the way that they speak to you, you know, like you have that same cadence, even if the cadence is like visually, but you're on a piece of paper. Yeah. That's a great tip. Works for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I've had some good grants. I applied for and got received two grants this year. One, which it kind of bumped me out because we didn't really get to use everything to its full potential, but I wrote a grant to buy materials for my, I have a class called Access Art Mm -hmm. and it's for students uh, on the autism spectrum and with some other disabilities. It's the first time we've ever run the class. So I I wanted to get some special adaptive materials just for them. Yeah. Then my other grant that I wrote was my larger grant was going back to fashion and your teaching informing your art and your art informing your teaching. Yeah. In the past couple of years, I've built this fashion program at my school. Oh, awesome. Yeah, it started off with, you know, the kids would always see what I was doing, started off with just having a fashion club, and then the club would get a little bigger every year. And then last year, you know, I teach advanced placement art. Mm -hmm. I, for the first time ever, did 3D, the 3D portfolio. And I had two girls or three girls that submitted 3D. Two of them did fashion out of recycled materials because that's kind of cool. And honest, and another girl did cosplay. And it's funny because the reason we got into doing recycled fashion is because we're broke. Yeah. You know, (laughs) which is, it kind of goes back to how I've lived my whole life. Like I grew up poor. And so, my goal when I would wake up, I'd rearrange my room, I'd put together a nice outfit, you know, I'd always do something to make things look better than how it really was. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm always constantly working with what I got, whatever it is to make beautiful things. So we, you know, have been doing this recycled fashion program at my school. The girls all made, you know, all passed their APs. I had two fives on those exams last year. And then this year, my AP fashion, five of them are submitting this year. That's awesome. And they're all making recycled fashion. Yeah. So the grant this year was to buy real dress forms. Yeah. So, I mean, we were making duct tape bodies. And, yeah, right. I've done that before, too. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, we had a couple of boys and we had two twins in the class. We're like, here, put this on real quick. And then it's like, then it's like, you don't, your hips aren't big enough. We need bigger hips, you know. Like, <laughs> but yeah, so this year we, we purchased dress forms. We have garment racks. And it's amazing. You know, we always did a great job working on mannequins people gave us, you know, whatever we could piece together. But when we got those 
brand new dress form, just the level of work went up and you can just see the excitement in the kids being able to work on these professional you know, mannequins. Then it starts to feel and even just the visual, like it starts to look more like we're in Project Runway. Yeah. I mean, and you come in my room and ignore the paint chipping off the ceiling part and, you know, <laughs> ignore, you know, all this stuff. Right. Focus. And, and people do. They And we've had visitors come in our room. My principal and my assistant principal, they always bring people by my room because they, they love to show off what we do. Yeah. And I love having that support. But they actually came in this year. They peeked in. I was, of course, you know, as a teacher, you're at your desk gobbling up your lunch right because you got like five minutes so I'm, and you're and you're also, you're also on the computer and you're also checking your phone real quick and you got to go to the restroom yeah. too so I'm at my computer like in mid bite every you know phone in my hand you know checking email all that stuff and they pop in my room and they're like hey Miss G is there if we bring in a couple people and show them your stuff I was like of course they bring in like 20 people into my room oh it's the it's the chamber of commerce but I was able to show wow. yeah I was able to show them what we did and, and they don't look at how old my classroom is or they look past all that and they're looking directly at the fashions that the kids are making and because it's, it's funny because because of me loving the art and the fashion you know it led to including that into my classroom and then it led to this successful AP student and then that led to grants and then having these people come into my room and see what we do that led to them getting connected with one of my high school seniors seeing that she wanted some things for college but didn't have the money they paired up they got her all this stuff for college Ugh. and then since I met these people I was nominated for their actual award in their organization and was a finalist for that you know it's like oh. all these things just connect and react off of each other that's always been kind of a cool thing yeah and it makes you realize every every interaction is worthwhile yeah. and like every little moment really matters and can lead to something yeah so you can't take any any meeting you know for granted mm -hmm. and it just I always think when something like that happens I always think of that, I don't know if I'm aging myself or dating myself, but that one song that Lauren Hill wrote where she said, everything is everything, you know, and it really, yeah, it really is. Everything yeah. is everything. So, you know, I always treat every situation like it, it will lead to the next thing. And every person, you know, every person I meet is part of that bigger story too. So, you know, you always treat people well and make the best of any situation. And with your own work, do you seek out opportunities with your I own do. artwork and yeah. sort of where where and how? I'm really lucky because in South Florida where I am, you know, there's a lot of different art groups and there's it's just a really active scene. When I first mm -hmm. came to Florida, I wasn't making a lot of art, you know. I, I had not started making art every day and I first started getting to know people and I would encourage anybody moving to a new area to find out where the art scene is and just immerse yourself mm -hmm. in it. You'll find your people. But there was a yeah. group this uh a lady named Teresa or a girl named Teresa was doing this thing called Art Nouveau event. And so a friend of mine and I would go and we would do, it was basically like art shows, kind of like a craft show, like where people have tables and they put art and it would be at a bar. Mm. So that's fine. But it would also be like sometimes like on a Thursday night, you know, or some night during the week. And I mean, right. I'm not saying how many times I've been to a bar because I'm a teacher or, or you, but allegedly the way <laughs> bars work is they're open up late, you know? So when you do those shows, you'd be there to two in the morning. Yeah. They weren't all the time. There's like one a month, but you know, so we would get together each yeah. show would have a theme. There was an Edgar Allan Poe theme. There was a Valentine's Day, like all kinds of just fun themes, pop art. So we would do this show, get there at like eight, nine, set up. Usually there'd be a band or a DJ, live body painting, all kinds of cool stuff food vendors mm -hmm. and then you would be at your table hopefully selling work till two in the morning and that was when I was working at the middle wow. school and that was a little bit of commute so I would get home and go to sleep and then have to be up at five to get ready for school but Ugh. it was worth it because I made all these contacts but yeah really lucky here because there's just a ton of different art groups that are always having shows the teachers get together here and have shows and you know I've, I've had mm -hmm. since I've been doing work you know I have had some of my own solo shows I had a retrospective down in Sunrise when I'd completed five years of art. And that's funny because I got that show from the private school where I worked, which was not the best situation. But one of the guys in charge who was always kind to me. I was always, you know, he was who I always went to to let him know kind of what I was struggling with. And he remembered me and my work. And when he left and went to a new position and he was able to book artists for shows, I was the first artist he contacted. Uh. So you know, just yeah. being real and you know, being kind to people and, you know, not even going into anything like 
I would never have been nice to him because I thought he could do something for me. I was nice to him because I liked him as a nice guy. And then later on, people remember your mm-hmm. kindness and your commitment to work and reward you for that. Yeah. So yeah, so I'm always looking, if I see my friends are doing something, I'll, I'll check it out. And I, if I miss that deadline, I'll try to catch the next one. And it's funny, I'm sure you probably have something like it, where you have a folder on your computer or uh, something on Facebook where you save all the artist calls. You're like, oh, I'm going to do that. I'm, I'm, I, that's yeah. <laughs> that's going to be me. So I, I have that. Right. And sometimes I'm good. And I, I do it, but then sometimes I just, <laughs> I forget. <laughs> so that's something right. I, I'm definitely, I'm mm. trying to be better at, but, you know, I participated in, you know, just some group shows this year. I did have a pop-up show at the cultural council over the summer and they liked my work. So I extended it into another month and just switched out the work. But because I was able to get that show, I was able to get my AP students work in an adjacent gallery. So that that was very oh, nice. special to see their work in a gallery setting. And uh, yeah. I actually, this is a first for me. I, I did a public art project here in Palm Beach County uh-huh. where, yeah. you know, I submitted my work and did a presentation in front of a panel. But to my one of my pieces is going to be printed on this special like vinyl material and wrapped around a traffic box in the western part of the county. So that's, oh, that's cool. kind of cool. I've never, I've never done public yeah. art before. So I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. If I was a new artist coming to this area, or going to a new area, I would say when you see that there's somebody's having an art show or there's, you know, some type of art fair or anything going on, go to it and talk to people. But I would also mm-hmm. say the more important thing when you're talking to the artist, you're trying to establish something for yourself, probably. But listen mm-hmm. to what they're talking about. Right. You know, don't go in there and be like, I do this, blah, blah, blah. Like, let them talk. It's their thing. You know, you're at their event. Give them some respect. Appreciate what they're doing. And all the connections will happen. Yeah. Like yeah. people can tell if you're being real with them or not. But I've been lucky because I've, I've made a lot of connections with people here that have led to, you know, other shows and just having some really good friends that good artist friends that do work that I'm just enamored with. I love. Yeah, it's amazing to have a good local yeah. art scene and community of like minded people. Yeah. And it's fun because everybody goes to everybody's stuff. And of course, I love fashion and I love putting together outfits. And a lot of times, like when I'm in a show or I go to my friend's shows, I will coordinate, put together an outfit, sometimes make jewelry that specifically goes with whatever their theme is, just because oh, it's, cool. it's fun to do. You know, like I, we surprised, we surprised yeah. my friend Kianga in Orlando, and she's a quilt artist. She deals with African textiles, and she's just she's just the most beautiful spirit you've ever met, like just big smile. She, you go, you spend 10 minutes with her, you just felt like you just had a therapy session. She's just amazing. Yeah. But um, I had bought some fabric from her and not told her why, and then I showed up with my husband at her show two and a half three hours away and I made earrings out of her fabric to wear to her show oh cool. so you know just, just yeah. fun stuff like that you know so you turn it into everything's a big event and it's fun to do yeah and you mentioned that at some of those early events you were selling mm-hmm. work do you try to do you continue to sell your work and where and how do you do that yeah I don't do as many of I haven't done one of those kind of things in a while I, if I have a show of my work I put prices on it sell things mm-hmm. some venues and some shows have more purchases than the other I, I had a show this past summer and it was fashion illustrations that I'd made a lot of them I'd made I went to SCAD for a workshop a teaching workshop it was amazing that was actually my first and only formal training in fashion illustration because every, everything wow. else has been me reading books and looking online so I was actually able to yeah. go and you know take an actual class so that was awesome uh, Lara Wolf was my teacher but mm-hmm. when I came back from that I had a show at a coffee shop and sold a bunch of pieces. Oh, nice. You just never know. But it's kind of funny because the volume of work that I make, you know, I post it and then I'm already moved on to the next thing. I don't think about it. And if I have a show, then I'll promote the show, hopefully sell work. Anyone that follows my work or collects it knows that I just post it. They contact me, give them the pricing. You know, it's, it's funny because my husband, I told you we came to Florida because of him. He got his doctoral yeah. degree. He's a PhD at marketing. He's a marketing professor. So you uh-huh. would figure with a marketing professor as a husband <laughs> that I would be like this, this awesome like selling machine, but I'm not because that's secondary for me. Yeah, it's like I make the work because I love it. And a lot of times I'll, I'll give work away, like I did with the Project Runway designers and stuff. Yeah, usually I sell work when I have shows or people just directly contact me. I did for a while try. I did Fine Art America for a little bit, mm-hmm. and it was it was okay. You know, I sold a couple prints and had some people purchase things to be put on like phone cases and stuff. 
Yeah. But usually when I do sell, I'm selling the original work at a show or, you know, face to face with someone. Right. So hopefully, and that's another thing you would think with this quarantine going on that I'd be opening up an Etsy and doing all this, but right. the, te- the virtual teaching is, is taking up a little bit of my life right now. <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot. It's a lot. Do you want to talk about that at all? Like how that's going and what resources you're using? Yeah, it, I'll say this right now. People, I, I think people get it, but I don't know if people get it. Most mm-hmm. of us teachers, <laughs> we're prepared for going to the classroom, teach the kids, classroom management, you know, lesson planning, all that. We got board configurations. We got Marzano. We know how to do all that. But basically what happened is the district, the powers that be, said to us teachers, you're going to teach online. And we said, uh, okay. And we did it. And that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Even if you feel, even if you feel like you are the worst virtual teacher <laughs> ever, you're still doing it. That's amazing. So with virtual teaching, I feel like you go through highs and lows where like you'll have like, you know, you'll, you'll come up with it. Like, you know, you're doing your lessons and stuff. Like you come up and you're like, oh, this is great. The kids are going to love this. I'm the best. Mm-hmm. And then crickets. You're right. like, Did y'all like it? Uh. Or can I get some feedback? <laughs> and I set up my lessons, but for me, and I feel like it's hard because you're trying to be the best teacher you can, so you just want to go at it. But then at the same time, you got to remember with high school, they've got however many other classes. You don't know what happened with their family life. Right. A a lot of my kids are working full time. Uh, And still working through this. Trying to, you know, those are the kids that I might not hear from. So I'll get an email, you know, where maybe they've done attendance, maybe they haven't you know, miss, um, you know, my dad's making all this new construction and I know this family, so I know it to be true. Right. I'm going to try to get it done. And that's when you're like, you know what, we, we can modify some stuff. You know, I have another yeah. student who stressed because he needed face to face person. You know, he didn't have the confidence to be doing some of the artwork on his own, worried about whether it's good or not, which I could totally work with him in class, yeah. but he doesn't want to be tied to a computer having to do, you know, video with me. Uh, obviously he's living his life. So for that student, I'm like, you know what, I noticed that you're good at technology. I'm going to have you create some Google Slides based on these artists or techniques. And then I, I tell him, I'm like, you know what? If it's good enough, I might use them next year. Yeah. So then he's like, ah, oh, this is, you know, and then I'm, I'm killing. You just got to get out of your box of how it has to be and it has to be the same for everybody. And just always remember, I'm doing my best. They're mm-hmm. doing their best. Even though, you know, there's some kids that aren't doing their best, really, but the majority of them, everybody's just doing their best. Yeah. It's, it's calming down a little bit for me now, but that first month, I mean... I would work during the day, you know, take a break for lunch and pet the cats and stuff. But then I'd be working at like 11 o'clock at night on stuff, you know, because I have I have high school. So I have students that are emailing, texting, direct message, you know, wanting feedback on right. work. And I'm trying to complete AP portfolios virtually, which is really stressful. But so it's calming down. But the biggest takeaway, let's say we have to do this again in the fall, which is probably mm-hmm. on some level we will, right. is keeping it simple, but considering like what their life might be like, materials and things like that. And, and you know, stuff that they're going to feel like worth their time Yeah, that they will enjoy doing and take joy in. But I'm making my peace with virtual learning. <laughs> yeah, you kind of have to. Yeah, and, but that would be the one thing that I would say to teachers. Because I mean, there are some teachers that are awesome that are like, oh, I've been doing Google Classroom and I've been, you know, videotaping and stuff like that. It's new for me. And I get nervous talking on videos and things like that. Cause I'm always a little nervous about my accent. You know, you never like hearing yourself, which is going to be interesting hearing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You just do best. Yeah. When you know better, you do better. But yeah. definitely any teacher, which is all of us that have had to switch to doing virtual, like y'all, we put in the work for this, pat ourselves on the back. Oof, yeah. I keep hearing this phrase right now that this is time for imperfect action. Yeah. That <laughs> that's just- that's- that's what I've been doing. Go for it. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I've been doing. I didn't know there was a name for it. but <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, you know, everybody's doing the best. And for me, it's winding down. Um, my seniors finish on the 15th. So this week was my final week of giving them stuff and uh, get everything turned into me so that next week I can still contact those last minute people and just give everybody time to get caught up with everything. Right. And then we finish. Everybody finishes at the end of this month. Wow. Yeah. So you're kind of wrapping up now. Yeah. Yeah. I like to do things ahead of time. So I'm getting them pre-wrapped up yeah, and, and yeah. that's so that I can really focus on finding those kids that, you know, aren't responding to emails and only respond to a direct mm-hmm. message. I don't know where you are, kids. But I'm going to find you. Yeah. I will find you <laughs> and you will do some work for me and you will like it. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, virtual teaching. 
<laughs> yeah. A whole whole new ball game. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, well, thinking of wrapping us up a little yeah. bit, I have just a few kind of fun, like get to know you even more mm-hmm. questions. Uh, what are you curious about right now? I'm really curious about figuring out well, I guess it's not really a thing to figure out. I'm just scared, but it's really using the the live platform, mm-hmm. you know, using that more. Because I, I do feel like when I do the time lapse videos on my Instagram and my Facebook, people really respond and they enjoy that. So I want to get better at putting together a setup where I can do those, but then simultaneously go live where you can see me yeah. and communicate. So I'm curious. I'm just curious on how I would do it and the technology where I would put which devices and stuff. So that's something that I'm thinking about. And then if teaching is going to go more towards this, you know, maybe next year, what if I did do some type of classes online like that? Right now, I'm not interested in doing any anything beyond school. Once I'm done with school, I'll close down that computer. And I'm not trying to Zoom anybody or whatever Google is. <laughs> but in the future, right? once I've had time to rest from all this. <laughs> but that, that's, that's something that I, I am wanting to do a little bit more. Yeah. And do you feel like teaching has, like teaching this way has kind of pushed you more in that direction? It has because I've done more videos and I've dedicated a space in my studio so that I have, you know, an area where I can meet virtually meet with students and do more live demos and things like that. So it definitely, I don't know if I would have done it if this hadn't happened. Yeah, because it is, I'm starting to feel the same way too, that, you know, I'm still a little nervous on video. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) But the more you do it, the more it's like, okay, I'm fine. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay, really fun one. What is your go-to order at your favorite restaurant? Well, depending on the restaurant, this week, and actually the whole quarantine, all I've cared about is Mexican food in various formats. You know, we just got off Taco Tuesday. We had a huge fail Taco Tuesday here at the Geronda house. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. It was bad. It was was bad. You add a a pandemic, people being closed, on takeout only, last minute. It was a recipe for disaster. But um, my favorite... I love chips and guac. I love mm-hmm. chips and guac. I love tacos. I love just potato chips too. Yeah, you know, we had a total disaster on uh, Taco Tuesday, and it ended up being Tostito Tuesday because <laughs> the, they ran out of tacos. And then I don't even want to say the other place we went, and there's a line wrapped around. I don't even want to say it. And oh. then the only thing we were able to get is some guacamole from Chipotle and some Tostitos from the convenient mart. And so oh. it was sad, a very sad occasion. But chips and guac are what I like. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> ideally that's what I would want like real ones not the ones from the convenience mart <laughs> right I know it's been so tricky like thinking of materials kids are gonna have yeah. and then you know well, like I did a clay lesson and was oh. like okay well they could make homemade play-doh mm-hmm. but all the recipes ask for flour which not I can't has. find yeah. in the store yeah <laughs> yeah so, yeah we've yeah. done uh, the first lesson I did, I had them set up a spot in their home where they were going to do their work, Mm -hmm. like, you know, kind of setting the stage for creativity. And then that kind of tricks them into cleaning their room a little bit too. But, you know, and and, (laughs) and hopefully it spills over. Yeah, well, hopefully it spills over to their academic classes because they cleared off their desk or somewhere, you know, where that's going to be where they're going to do their work. Even if it's not permanent, even if they put everything in a shoebox and when it's time to work, they put it on the table, you know. So I've been trying to do a lot of get up and do things, move things, find things for their class activity. Every week. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I was looking at this quote recently that was talking about change, and I'm not going to, I'm going to like butcher it if I try to <laughs> actually say it, but just talking about how when a butterfly goes through metamorphosis inside the cocoon, there's decay happening and it's not pretty. And the change that metamorphosis takes, things have mm-hmm. to end for there to be a new beginning. It's true. And, and it's funny, I'm specifically doing butterflies, including them in my work as just a, uh, not a major motif, uh. but a small motif in my, my work this month. But I'm doing a workshop with SCAD today is my last day. And for my project, it was to design a, an option was to design, design a collection, a fashion collection, yeah. you know, based on artist or movement. So I kind of wanted to flow into what I'm doing now. So what I did is I picked, have you ever seen Salvador Dali's Botanicals? Oh, no. I need to look that up. They're a 
amazing. Like I got to see them in person a couple of years ago at the Dali Museum. And it's just these mm-hmm. really beautiful small pieces on watercolors on paper. I believe they're watercolors. And, you know, his work is really like detailed and everything. Yeah. And uh, I, I just always remembered those, you know, sticking to me. So my, you'll see the pictures later on Instagram. But um, so I've got six girls and I'm including diversity. They're all different colors, different shades of peach and brown and dark brown together, you know, in one fashion yeah. grouping. But the dresses all come from inspiration from that work. But when you were talking about butterflies, uh-huh. there's a Maya Angelou quote that I always think of. She said, we delight in the beauty of the butterfly, but rarely admit the changes it has gone through to achieve that beauty. And I like bought on, yeah. you know, because it's like, uh, you know, everybody's like, oh, these butterflies are so beautiful. But, you know, the work and the that metamorphosis process isn't always the most beautiful thing which I think that's what we're seeing now. We're we're in the cocoon now and we're, yeah. you know, we're going to come out the other side. We're going to be very beautiful, but right now it's yeah. a little ugly. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. And it takes continued work to get out yes, the other like side. Every, everything is a, something, a thoughtful thing that you're putting out there to hopefully have a positive impact, like even the smallest little thing. Right. So along those lines, I have yes. a couple of questions. So first, I'm curious just for myself, but also for listeners to kind of build their like library of artists to share. Yeah. Do you have any Black artists or Latinx artists, other artists of color that you would recommend yes. that you feel like you've shared and really, really impact students? I am going to shamelessly plug my friends. Yes, do it. <laughs> and I, I've been doing this because these are people that, you know, I've had access to expose my students to, to bring to our school, to, you know, participate in things for them. So not only based on their talent and heart, but just these are people like, I want everybody to know. Um, and they do happen to be people of color. Yeah. Like that's secondary, but they're amazing people and they're local artists. One of my favorite mm-hmm. local artists is an artist, Yanga uh, Janaki, and I'll send you her website. She's a, actually a fiber artist. So, you know, a lot of times the go-to person that you would include in your curriculum would be like a Faith Ringgold. Everybody's got a Faith Ringgold lesson. Mm-hmm. We, we, yeah. know, we know, everybody's <laughs> got a quilt lesson. Well, Kianga is a contemporary working artist now, local, and she does her own style of story quilting. And a lot of times when with her work, I, l- I love about her work is she um, works usually specifically with African textiles, authentic Af- African textiles. Mm. But a lot of times she like, lets that fiber speak to her and she might go into it with her idea, but a lot of times the things will change or, you know, an idea might come from what she sees in the fabric. But she makes she does dolls. I love her dolls. They're amazing. And she actually had a, a pretty major show here in the fall. My husband and I went, so we traveled to Orlando to go support her. But just, if you know, if you meet her, everything's like super positive. But the work, the work is just really, really great quality, creativity, the color, the patterns, you know, all those elements and principles of art. If that's, you know, how you're, you're more of a DBA teacher, like you're able to, uh, DBAE, you're able to really hit all that yeah. with her. But yeah, she's a great artist. And like, said a great friend and she's doing some online classes like everybody right now yeah but I would definitely <laughs> shout her from the rooftop and then um, another local artist and this is a totally different direction but Anthony Burke if you are trying to teach portrait drawing he he's a great example he does these just gigantic drawings a lot of times they're charcoal and paper or like a really dark graphite but I'm, I mean some of them are like as tall as me some of his drawings and Sometimes wow. it'll include, it'll be all grayscale and then it'll have a pop of color, usually like a colored pencil or watercolor. He incorporates drips in there sometimes, but the areas that are rendered are like fully, highly photographic rendering. So, you know, if you're teaching yeah. portrait drawing and you want to show it like in a new way, instead of just, a, you know, all the same, you know, media, he really has a great take on portrait. I would show his work to my high school students all the time, the ones that really like drawing faces. And then he yeah. also does work like nature work nature thing mm-hmm. so I appreciate it because I am terrible at drawing animals like terrible but <laughs> like so I look at what he does and I'm like oh maybe if I work you know 100 million hours I could look like you know but <laughs> right. his work it's really cool because a lot of times he'll focus on you know endangered species or support local causes but they're just really highly detailed animal portraits but then they're also loose at the same time and he does them on paper he also does them on cigar boxes that he you know like locally mm-hmm. sources from people so 
it's kind of cool because, you know, you're showing the students mm. at the same time that you don't always have to use a piece of paper. You can use something around you to do your artwork on. Right. I really love showing his work to my students. And he and his wife, Trina, she's also a fiber artist and she does just fun little cloth doll pieces and does poetry and everything. But as a couple, they've helped with the local other local artists. It helps provide opportunities for my students specifically. Like they have this thing called Continuum every year. And they partner. There's another artist, Craig McGinnis, which I was like, he's amazing too. He's not a person of color, but his work is very colorful. <laughs> But they had this great program called the Young Masters Program, and mm -hmm. students were able to apply, and then if they were selected, be a part of putting up this local prestigious show, and they actually had work in it, and there were awards, and they got to um, have a full day uh, of working with local artists. Like, Anthony was there sitting with my students, teaching them, like, how he does what he does. Oh, it was amazing. Yeah, that's incredible. And I actually got to teach that day. They asked me to teach fashion illustration that day, so I had a great time showing case and what I do outside the classroom to my kids. Yeah. But yeah, so that's another local artist couple, actually, that put up separate website. And then in a totally different direction, I have this wonderful friend, Jason. We call him Jay Flo. He, when I first met him years ago, uh, he's Haitian. He had just started painting after the earthquake. He felt compelled to, to paint. He was very impacted by it. And, you know, he started off doing portraits and some of his work is yeah. political and stuff. But in the past, I guess it's like two years, he taught himself how to animate Oh. Like just sat down wow. in front of a computer and taught himself wow. how to do animation. And he makes these great videos promoting other black artists and, you know, important people in black history, Haitian Americans that he wants to highlight. And also like fairy tales from African proverbs and just all like just really cool stuff. Mm. I really admire him because he just put himself out there, let everyone see him learning how to do this. And I mean, he's got yeah. a cartoon that's running on the local PBS station now. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, and I love that letting people see the learning process because yeah. I think that can really help students. Yeah. And um, he actually came to my classroom, French Mall. They came, I don't know if he came this year or the year before to share his work with my students. And it was very impactful for my students specifically because he is Haitian and many of my students are. And they just, mm -hmm. you know, their eyes just lit up. They were really listening mm -hmm. to him and just really, really enjoying what he had to say and hearing his perspective on stuff yeah but yeah so you know those are just four local people that are really yeah. good representatives because they're just all different you know you have Kianga doing the fiber art and then you've got Anthony doing your drawing and painting and Jay Flo of course has fabulous paintings but now you know he's working more with the animation and that's pretty amazing yeah and I love hearing how how your students responded to him and just I mean, I feel like that really hits back to that point about representation. Yeah. And seeing someone who they can see themselves in mm -hmm. makes such a big difference. Yeah, that really helped my students just see like a possibility for themselves. It's not as a career, but as, you know, an outlet for themselves. Mm -hmm. And my colleague, Brent, he actually, every year he brings the Lake Worth area has a book fair kind of book celebration of reading. And they always have a local artist. And Brent always makes it a point to have that local artist come to Lake Worth. And one year he had Adele Rodriguez. Do you, you know, familiar with Adele Rodriguez? No, I have to look her up. It's, it's a, it's a man. I'm probably saying it. I'm probably saying I'm trying to, I know it sounds like Adele. I'm probably selling it, yeah. saying it like terrible because of my accent and because I don't know how to say it, but oh. he is Cuban American and he's had, um, oh, he's a political okay. artist, but he has worked multiple Time Magazine covers. Wow. And he came to us, you know, with his experience, you know, as a person from Cuba and he's got this really intense point of view and this really graphic style, but really, really amazing. And that was somebody that the kids actually got to meet in person. Yeah. Wow. So they love uh, that. Yeah. Well, that's one I'll have to look up. And I feel like also that <laughs> my little like calling this man her just based on hearing the name is like just another little thing that we unconsciously do yeah well and I think sometimes you know it's like the pronouns matter yeah yeah <laughs> so I'm sorry but I feel like that might be another thing that keeps people from jumping in full-heartedly with things because you know you might be nervous like what if I say a name wrong or what if I yeah it's hard to put yourself out there as an educator and to show something that's not your typical you know what 
what everybody knows and what's been in everybody's curriculum, but it's okay, you know, and it's fine to celebrate the artists that are working now. Going back to Brent, who is just white dude, awesome, like fun surfer guy. Like I made fun of him last year because his hair got super long with the pandemic, but you know, this is the man that is bringing this great opportunity in for his students, you know, because he sees it's important. And another artist that he brought in, oh my gosh, have you heard of John Para? No, so many to add to my list. So, and I'll send you links. Yeah. Yeah. I'll send you links to these, um, John Para. And I, I didn't, these are, you know, it's like, I know who they are now. But I didn't know. Yeah. So he is an illustrator for children's books. And mm. he he is amazing. <laughs> he has my favorite book, of course, is the one that he wrote about Frida Kahlo. So she's my favorite. And just his illustration style is just beautiful. I mean, he's just amazing. He's from here, but he does do his, you know, he's got the Hispanic background, but he's an American artist. But yeah, John Kara, just really great illustration style that would appeal, especially if you teach elementary school students. Yeah. Ooh, I have to look him up. Too. Yeah. You're going to be really excited when you see, you know, his imagery is amazing. But yeah, and those are two artists that I would never have known about or had the opportunity to bring in. But luckily my colleague had the connections to help bring them into our classroom. But, you know, the other artists are actually my, my friends yeah so, so that's yeah. good too like have yeah. um have diversity in your life <laughs> and it goes over into your teaching right yeah that's huge and then yeah I love your point earlier about being nervous being yeah. scared to kind of step into this and like am I gonna pronounce their names wrong well, you might. Yeah, and I, I may have totally <laughs> yeah. butchered them myself, but I want people to, they can, you know, you can get past my terrible pronunciation and look them up and, you know, find out who they are and be amazed by their work. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. You know, and when I first started teaching in general, I mean, you do kind of teach the normal stuff, you know, Matisse and, you know, Van Gogh. And, you know, you feel like you're doing a good job because that's what everybody's been doing before. And there's tons of resources on it. Mm-hmm. But when you venture out and start highlighting the artists down the street, or a regional artist, you know, you do have to do a little bit more research for that kind of thing. Yeah. But you're creating more original content. And then you're also uplifting that artist and perpetuating yeah. like our overall art Absolutely. community. So it's all, all a win-win. Yes, that's amazing. And I feel like you've touched on this a bit, but are there any ways that you have worked to really create an anti-racist environment in your classroom? Basically, as an educator, I nip it in the bud. If you come in in my class, I don't care what grade level, we're not going to speak to each other in a manner that's demeaning to your race, your religion, right. you know, your sexual orientation. If it's high school level and people know what your business is, like it's, there's no place for it. So you just really have to set the tone, yeah. leave it outside the door, you know, and actually go to the end of the earth and drop it off. Or drop it off. We don't need that. So you just normalize mm-hmm. that community where we don't do that you know we're positive yeah it'll be interesting for me next year you know because I'm going to be working with the younger kids so I'll have to report back to you on that but you know yeah I think at any grade level setting parameters for how it is appropriate to talk to people and sometimes people just don't know yeah you know sometimes you're like you know what they just don't know how to act Mm -hmm. and it sounds like a funny expression but sometimes people don't so sometimes if you gently you know with a younger grade you can gently like hey that we don't do that the first time you know as it keeps perpetuating you got to stop it. But, you know, just letting people know what the expectations are right up front. And then in the things that you do and how you speak to people, how you position your body when you're talking to people, the kind of examples you show, all of that Mm -hmm. is how you can model what you want to see in your classroom. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think bringing in those artists, you know, several artists that are not old white men or, you know, dead white men. Like that, that does model. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with old dead white men. That's fine. But, you know, it's just, you're just missing out. It's like if you eat, it's like if you ate mm-hmm. cheese pizza all the time and that's the only food you ever ate, you know, right. like you don't know about Cheetos, you don't know about steak, <laughs> you don't know about a gastro pub, what they've got on their menu, you don't know about chicken tenders, tacos, you know, like there's just so much you're missing out on. So don't, you know, live your life like a buffet. Well, that's actually a terrible example now with the pandemic. No more buffets. Uh, <laughs> you remember buffets? Uh, buffets were fun remember that <laughs> yeah 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 no more <laughs> yeah 
Those were the olden days. Um, yeah, my husband jokes, you know, every time he comes in and he, we're not doing it as much anymore because things have kind of lightened up a little bit. But we would, as soon as we walk in the door, we would disinfect our shoes and everything, go wash our hands, which we still wash our hands. But John always jokes. He's like, why does Uncle John always like all his shoes when he comes in? You know, it's like the pandemic, the <laughs> pandemic of 2020. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So you might have to. Yeah. But I love that analogy of like, there's nothing wrong no. with cheese pizza, but you don't yeah. want it all I, the time, every yeah, day for every meal. Yeah, and I love meal. cheese pizza. Like <laughs> that's going to make me want pizza for the rest of the day. <laughs> but yeah, you know, and I think it, it's the same thing with showing new artists. You know, I think people just overthink, oh my gosh, you know, how am I going to make this, you know, inviting space for kids? And don't overthink it. Don't overthink it. Mm-hmm. I'm a big believer in, even at the high school level, I always had um, specific seating. Like I, I never just said, hey, come in and do what you want. Like never, never did that. So, mm-hmm. you know, you as a teacher can, you know, make sure you've got, you know, a balance when you set up your seating but you know just something as small as standing by the door every day which I always have done every 16 years of teaching I've always done and saying hello to every kid that comes in with the same amount of hey how are you because then they're, they're automatically being like I'm being treated like everybody else in here like we're a big family this is my art home yeah uh, yes oh yeah and I'm sure people will be looking up this stuff like I'm already seeing them like you know the groups on Facebook and everything people are like you know what are we gonna do about this we're gonna do you know with the pandemic and the clean and the art supplies oh, and what yeah. if we go virtual and what if the race tensions are really really strong and not a good thing and people feel like they can't do anything but we can't not yeah. and can't not if that's a double negative <laughs> my English she could be mad but it's true everybody's got to do their part yes yeah and to keep coming back like I keep seeing all the momentum and hearing like don't stop yeah. don't let don't let this be just like a week or two where you say right. black lives matter and then you go back to your life <laughs> yeah it's like no like just like black art matters it doesn't just matter in february right you know female art matters like we don't we're not going to just teach female art one certain month and then like okay you know it takes all people all the artists to make you know this great magnificent world that we're in so you know you don't want to leave anybody out <laughs> So what is the best compliment you've ever received? My favorite thing that anybody can say to me is not about my work. Like, that's fine. If you like Mm -hmm. it, great. You don't, that's fine. The best compliment is I saw what you're doing and I'm making more work now too. Uh, That is just my favorite thing when somebody tells me like, I saw you making work every day. I'm, I'm trying to make more work too. Or I'm, I'm working every day. Like that is the best feeling to know that you got another teacher, another artist, or just a regular little person getting outside their comfort zone and committing to being creative and making art or whatever it is they do. That, that's the best. Yeah, that you're inspiring someone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the best. And if they like oh. my work and buy it, that's nice, but yeah. <laughs> I'll take that over down a piece of work any day. Yeah, uh, that's great. Which is why I have uh, so much work at home. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, one of your questions was how can people contact me about buying work and things like that? Yes. So, <laughs> I have an Instagram account, keep it up to date. The story's always got something fun. There's cats, there's sparkly things, there's gifts, there's one stop shopping. It's fun. So, that is art by JLG. So, Jennifer Ledronda, obviously. Yeah. I have a Facebook page, Jennifer Ledronda Art. My website, is jenniferlovegeronda.com kind of a recurring theme yeah. and um, <laughs> if there are any teachers my classroom Instagram account is really fun there's a ton of recycled fashion on there because that's really our specialty mm. but it's Studio Geronda okay cool and I'll link to all of this too oh, okay yay yeah awesome and is there anybody you would want to give a shout out to or like thank the number one person well my mom like ob- obviously got Mother's Day coming up her birthday this month too yeah. but you know know, she always made sure, even if we didn't have materials, she always made sure, you know, I had art stuff. She really instilled my love for fashion. We never had money, but I was always one of the best dressed kids in class. Uh, my stuff may have been $3 and it came from Goodwill, but it looked nice. So she really instilled in me clothes and looking nice and putting together things and, you know, not having to spend a bunch of money. And uh, so obviously big shout out to my mom and happy Mother's Day and, you know, yeah. birthday and all that stuff. And then my husband, he's just, he's amazing. Like he's uh, a sounding board for you know any of the ideas I have he's my support he goes to uh, all my shows of course if he didn't go to my shows we have a problem <laughs> but um so he, he goes to all my stuff he helps me haul all my artwork up and down stairs whenever we move uh, and he's just always supportive of me and my teaching and me with my art and that's that's really important to have somebody that supports your dreams yeah awesome 
Well, thank you so much. It was really great getting to hear more about your work and your teaching. Thank yeah, you. awesome. What a great conversation. Jennifer shared so many valuable tips and advice. I love her commitment to both teaching and art making and how she builds connections. Everything is everything. Thank you, Jennifer. Head over to our blog to see links to not only her work, but the work of the other artists that she mentioned. That's at teachingartistpodcast.com. And while you're online, go check out our exhibit. It is at TAP Exhibit, so Teaching Artist Podcast. So that would be T-A-P Exhibit.com. Thank you so much for listening. As always, you can reach me at Teaching Artist Podcast on Instagram or teachingartistpodcast at gmail.com. Who do you want to hear from? Please share your recommendations of teaching artists. And if you loved this episode, please subscribe, leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts, and follow me. It really makes a big difference. Thank you. Thank you.